During this part of the program, during this part of the program, we're going to hear from each of the breakout groups, and the sequence will be uh, each of the uh, facilitators will give a brief discussion, and then we will open it up to your comments on that particular topic. Uh, if you have additional comments to make um, or have additions that you would like to make. After we've had a chance to go through all four of the breakout groups, we will then have a more general discussion and really try to identify any topics or areas that were not covered in any of the four breakout groups. With that, let me call on uh, Dr. Pavia to uh, give the report from the first breakout group on uh, epidemiological characteristics. So thank you. First, I want to thank uh, the group that participated in my breakout session for a really thoughtful discussion. And I uh, probably can't do justice to all of the uh, contributions they had. Let's see. There should be slides to summarize this. If not, I can. If there aren't, I'll talk us through it. So the, the overwhelming um, sentiment was that the real reason that the epidemiology needed to be understood was in the face of the question about congenital anomalies, because that is what's really making the emergence of this infection a public health emergency. And so those were the most critical uh, epidemiologic needs, clearly to, under, to nail down whether there is a true causal association between Zika and microcephaly and other congenital anomalies, what the risk of infection to a pregnant woman, what the risk of transmission to her fetus is, the risk by trimester, cofactors, uh, and understanding what the true spectrum of congenital anomalies will be, because it's almost certain to be quite a bit broader than simply what we've recognized so far as microcephaly and uh, failure of progression of neurodevelopment. All of this really is dependent on having more effective diagnostic tools. And when we think about an urgent need for research, then having uh, the diagnostic tools is necessary to do the research, as well as the research to establish better diagnostic tools is critical. Clearly, there's a need for better serologic tools that look at lifetime infection to true IgG assay uh, to ascertain the accuracy of the IgM assays and to make the sequence more uh, effective so that we don't need to do PRNT assays, to understand whether or not there can be urine or salivary testing that will have a longer interval to detect viral RNA or antigen. Any testing strategy depends on having good quality control, and there's an urgent need to develop standardized reagents that can be used to standardize the quality of testing that's going on throughout the country and around the world, as well as the development of commercial assays. And whatever uh, tests are developed need to be made available quickly, both for epidemiologic research and to answer the clinical, uh, the clinical urgent questions. Let's see if I can get us to the next slide. There we go. We had a very robust discussion about risk communication in the setting of epidemiology. And this communication needs to use both traditional media to try and uh, communicate risk once we understand it better, but also should be uh, a 21st century strategy that uses new media uh, that also assesses the effectiveness of risk communication, because as we've seen in all of our recent public health emergencies, what we think we're saying is not always what people hear, and risk communication needs to be tailored to the audience. There is an urgent need to understand the other modes of transmission and to communicate effectively about them. Sexual transmission probably produces the greatest level of anxiety of the other potential modes of transmission and will complicate messaging and, and uh, control efforts. But we need to understand whether there's a risk in transfusion, transplantation. And at the same time, we may be able to use transfusion screening as an epidemiologic tool to detect how much infection is out there that gets through voluntary deferral for travelers uh, and uh, looking for rash illness. Surveillance is a challenge for which we don't have all of the answers. There are a number of aspects of surveillance that are challenging. 
Uh, clearly, birth defect surveillance is central to understanding uh, the response to Zika. And birth defect surveillance is complicated enough in the U.S. where we have good networks, but doing it uh, in places where the birth defects will be seen first in a comprehensive way that accounts for background incidents and other causes is something that needs to be resolved. Uh, we need surveillance that's sensitive to new introductions of the virus. We don't know how long there is a, uh, the delay is between the first reported case and the actual introduction of virus, and if we're going to use prevention methods that are responsive and focused on areas where there are viremic individuals, then we need a more timely method of detecting uh, the introduction. We clearly need to understand the extent of infection and when there is some effect of uh, herd immunity. And we had a robust discussion about alternative ways of doing surveillance for a challenging illness. And uh, one of the ideas that was brought forward is the idea of using crowdsourcing as a potential way of detecting signal for possible novel birth defects or introduction of illness, understanding, of course, that with crowdsourcing, the signal-to-noise uh, ratio is always a challenge. And lastly, um, but maybe most importantly, something that kept coming up in the discussion was the availability of the data for rapid decision-making and for people to understand what d data other people were developing, what answers were coming in. And the challenge that we've seen in this outbreak is similar to what we've seen in multiple previous episodes, and that is that data sharing is difficult, understanding what's going on at any given time is challenging, and we need new methods, and we need perhaps to think about uh, different ways of thinking about data sharing. We've already seen advances from our journals in terms of doing rapid publication while still protecting scholarship and prior uh, publication rights. But there are other issues that need to be acknowledged, including uh, acknowledging the role and importance of investigators in given countries and not having countries with more resources coming in and taking information away. Uh, there are intellectual property in the, and the possibility of developing diagnostics or other uh, interventions for which there's a financial incentive. That needs to be respected. Patient privacy needs to be respected. But as these problems are solved, there still needs to be some way of bringing data centrally before it's been totally peer reviewed, before it's collated, so people know what uh, what data are being collected to prevent redundancy to allow multiple uses of the same data sources and reanalysis. And I think um, I'm going to stop there and try and leave time for discussion. Do you want to take any questions now if there are any specific points or uh, other comments from members of the group? Or we can save this for a more general discussion after all four of you have presented. Um, 